I wrote to you a few days ago, and I specified that Jesus had a bad day. In fact, Jesus had more than one bad day. He had many bad days. And we're going to decipher that in the Word of God so that you can get an, an understanding and maybe embrace the Lord a little more because you can embrace the fact that you can identify it with Him more. And it appears that Father God had a bad day also when His Son had a bad day. It appears that Father God had a bad day when the creation made in His image had a bad day. It appears that Father God never reveled in judgment, but yet He administers justice. It appears that our Lord knows what it means to have a tear of joy and a tear of sadness. It appears that our Lord understands what it means to smile and to frown. Can you imagine when God Almighty in His heavenly place lights up with a big bright smile and the angels who are privileged to stand before His face, they see that smile and how they must just tremble with joy and adoration in His glory. But then when you flip the page and they could see the smile disappear and the Lord be saddened or even worse, angered. Can you imagine their reaction? It's a different trembling. It's a trembling wondering, what shall He say? What shall He do? How shall we be sent? I want to share with you some truths in the Scriptures this morning that I believe will build upon what we've been talking about the last few weeks about the broken heart and about all of the ways we've been talking about that the Lord relates with us in those moments. And we're going to dig a little deeper now and we're going to touch souls, our soul with His soul. And as I wrote to you, I said, come this morning... Let us come together, yes, to fellowship, but I want to commiserate and celebrate with you. Now, commiserate means to empathize, right? To have compassion, to have some pity about some things. So it's okay for us to come together and have a pity party about some stuff. I mean, let's face it. Who wants to celebrate somebody else's bad day? Now, to be honest with you, it won't hurt my feelings at all if there's a few dictators in the earth that had a bad day today. So bad that maybe they weren't here tomorrow. Right? I'm just saying things y'all are afraid to say. I'm getting real with you. And I wrote to you and I said that I'm going to hit where the rubber hits the road. I'm going to get real. Because goody two-shoes, kumbaya, soft-touchy, schmoochy, Christianity isn't cutting it. It's not cutting it. That is not going to influence the evil one at all. You're not going to love and smile and, and embrace him and hug him into working along with you. We need to be those who have very tough skins and soft hearts. We need to be those who are wise and understand the attitudes and, and the beatitudes. We need those who, yes, have a heart of gratitude, but also have skin of steel so that we can absorb and deflect with a shield those arrows that come so quickly at us. Suddenly has come upon us. Sometimes we manufacture our own bad day, don't we? I mean, I know you're perfect and I'm not, and so I'm sure you never wake up and just, just are mean. You never wake up and just are foul. You never wake up and maybe your first thought is... <clears throat> and you could have gone to sleep that night in perfect peace. You could have gone to sleep that night laying in a field of grass with daffodils blowing over you and birds chirping in the sky and a nice plate of spaghetti waiting for you and meatballs <laughs> with homemade sauce. Yes. You could have had all those things, but somehow between that transition from darkness and twilight to morning, your spirit 
became agitated. And isn't it amazing when you know the Lord, and even when you don't, if you don't, there's some kind of a force, we can name it many things, that seems to sense and smell and know when it's time to throw some gasoline on the fire of your bad day. And just as you're thinking about it, maybe trying to escape it, maybe you turn the key in your car, you pull out of your driveway, you're headed to wherever you're going, whatever you're going to do, and sure enough, somebody just blows by you, and they're mean, and they're foul, and they're crude, and you wonder, how did they know I was having a bad day? Or something else happens, your tire gets flat. How many of you celebrate a flat tire? I, I, I have something for you. Right, it's called a slap to wake you up. How many of you celebrate the fact that somebody drained your bank account, huh? And some of you say, well, there wasn't much there in the first place. Yeah, but it was still yours. How many of you celebrate when, unfortunately, Doom and gloom comes upon you or a loved one or a family member and that night before you had no idea but in the morning instead of joy came some issues and problems. How many of us have looked at the next day as being too much more than what we thought we could handle? I can attest to you that there was a time in my life as I was making a transition from what I didn't understand to be deep, deep darkness into a twinkle of light. Now, I don't know about you, but it took me a long time to squeeze out a lot of flesh and stuff out of my person, out of my soul, and for my spirit to begin to understand that something was happening in a new creation. It didn't happen overnight. Yes, I got saved overnight. We all do when we accept Christ. And yes, I even had a deliverance, but it didn't change the temptations. It didn't change the flesh. It didn't change the evil onslaughts. I had to figure out how to work those things out. And there was a time when I was just hanging on by my fingernails. Am I the only one? Huh? If that's you too, just show me your fingernails. As I was praying and praising in the shower this morning, I don't know why, but I, I said, Lord, why do we have fingernails? Why isn't it just double flesh over there so I never have to cut those things? And then I thought about it, and I said, well, women sure do look nice when they paint their nails. And men, forgive me, but I don't really appreciate it when you do. <laughs> and, and the women look really nice when they have open toes and they paint their nails. And men, I have to tell you, your feet are ugly. Keep them in <laughs> shoes. And, and there are thir certain things that I thank God for in the species, and some I wonder why. Male are trying to look like female and female like male when neither of them merge too well together, do they? I mean, nothing's more than someone who dresses up like a woman and they got an Adam's apple that's bigger three times than mine. And I look at that and I say, oh my God, what is going on there? And then I see their hands are big enough to palm a basketball. And I say, oh my God, they could have been so pretty a different way. You see... God doesn't make a mistake. Amen. And we have fingernails because they can do certain things other things can't do. Now, there are many things that I'm very grateful for my wife's nails, but the one that I cherish and celebrate the most is when she scratches my back. <laughs> Ooh, those nails. I say, Lord, thank you for those nails. And one of the ways that... My, life, my wife and I romance and show each other affection as we scratch each other's backs. And boy, does she let me know when my nails need some help. God never makes a mistake. And sometimes we're hanging on by those nails spiritually. And sometimes we're just like, how am I going to make it another day? And you know what, beloved? There's been times in my life when a day was too far for me to look forward to. It was too much. I couldn't process it, I couldn't handle it. If you've ever been stuck in a, in a jail, an hour's too long, a week's too long, an overnight's too long. If you've ever 
put in an internment and under an arrest in, in a former communist country, let me tell you something, a minute is too long. Every sound is something you're trying to process. What are they going to do to me next? Every function is how it's a mind game. And how many of you know who the mind blinder is? Hmm? How many of you know he is called the mind blinder, the devil, the enemy of your spirit? And he has little armies of demons that come to blind our minds. And they smell just like a dog, like a, a bloodhound smells. They can smell when we have fear. They can smell when we're becoming anxious and anxiety. They can throw something at you from your past and all of a sudden you begin to believe it's part of your present. We don't battle against flesh and blood. We battle against principalities, powers in high places. You see, Paul got that revelation because he had to process and find it out. He had to realize that the things that were nagging at him from who he was as he was becoming who he was going to be weren't letting go of him too easy. And he was trying to understand whose voice was he hearing. Isn't it amazing that the great Apostle Paul, who was plucked out of total darkness, hatred, a zeal for the wrong God, a religion that said it knew God, but didn't know him. One that Jesus would later call whitewashed. Pharisees that teach. Rabbis, he said, that have souls that are like washed, whitewashed tombs full of dead man's bones and hypocrisy. That was Paul. And on his way to administer his office, if you will, as if he was the prince, to the king, Gamaliel, the chief rabbi, he was the next one in line. He was the prize student, so bright, understanding multiple languages, gifted, memorizing the Torah, bright, probably the brightest young Jew in those classes. On his way to administer what he thought was justice and then we get that famous statement in the scripture. Songs have been written about it. Blinded by the light on the Damascus way. And we understand that Jesus appears before him and the glory is so bright. And Paul, who is so dark, is blinded by the glory of God. Jesus Christ himself, the Prince of glory, the King of glory. And in that state, he saw the bright light, but he ended up having a bad day. You can be in the light and have a bad day. He got blinded. He got blinded so much that scales came on his eyes like a reptile. Have you seen a snake that closes its eyes or even worse, an alligator or a crocodile? Have you seen those closed eyes? They, they're scaly. They, they look like something that needs chiseled open. That was Paul's eyes. And the Lord had him stammer and go off to another place and sent somebody who we don't see in the Bible again to pray for him to open his eyes and to see the light in the midst of a bad day. Now it took a few days. And that just started a bad season for Paul. You say, what? Oh, yeah. We don't see much about it those couple years that he was taken and he went from that road to Damascus, but he went into Syria and he went into Syria to get all of the garbage out of his system that was in there, that legalistic Jewishness that was in him. And then he was filled with the real spirit of the Jews, Jesus Christ. It took a couple years. Can you imagine what he went through in those couple years? Now, maybe you had one of the most amazing transitions in life. Maybe you just came to the Lord and everything after that was instant and you understand it and your eyes were open and you had nothing but a good day. It wasn't my story. I went into all-out battle from the moment on. 
So I can relate to that. I can relate to why Paul needed to be set off to somewhere to get it straight. The Lord did the same thing to me. Fortunately, mine wasn't three years. I could relate why he had to let go of everything so he could hold on to some stuff. And I can relate how bad those days had to be when all of a sudden all of your peer group is gone. Your social structure is gone. Your way of life is gone. You're no longer your own, even though you thought you were before. It's all gone, gone in an instant. It's a bad day. But what it does when we have these bad days, it trains us up so that we can handle and tolerate and overcome even worse days, even death itself. And so that's the beginning of becoming an overcomer in Jesus Christ. In Revelation, we understand that the ones that are heralded, the ones that receive the commendations, even spoken of by the Spirit of Christ through John in Revelation, is that these are those who overcome or overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And the word of their testimony should not be, I'm celebrating, I'm having a bad day. That's foolish. Nobody's going to believe you. I won't believe you. If you wake up and tell me you had the worst migraine of your life right now, but you're celebrating God in it, I'm going to say to you, something's wrong with you. (laughs) We need to pray that bad headache away, and, and I'll commiserate with you. You see, what's happened in our Christian faith is that we've been expected to be inhuman in it. We've been required to be something that we're not, and we always try and we strive to be more than we are. We strive to be the one who won't cry when it's the time to cry. We strive to be the one who won't confess, I have a headache right now because now you're making a bad confession We strive to say that we're not judging anybody when in our spirit and in our heart we're assessing people by their failures and what they've done. And we always ask that question, why did this come upon them? As we wonder for ourselves what might come upon us. You see, that's called inhuman. That's not real. And we get this attitude, this belief that Jesus, who never sinned, was absolutely perfect on earth. (laughs) If he was absolutely perfect, then he wasn't flesh. As I was praying about this, and, 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 and it came upon me earlier on in the week, while I was somewhere else, and I was in the midst of having some time sitting and I was in a studio and I was looking at some things and looking at some great people and women of faith and and I began to wonder, I don't know why my mind went that way. I began to wonder, I wonder who on that wall of faith and hope might be having a bad day right now. Yeah. And then my mind began to wander and I pinpointed a few in the spirit and I said, I'm going to pray for them right now that their bad day transitions into a good day. And their fear becomes something that has hope. And then while I was doing that, all of a sudden it plopped in my spirit and what came in was, did Jesus ever have a bad day? And immediately, as one who knows the Word of God somewhat, and one who fears the Lord, out of my own mouth, I said audibly, Jesus has had many bad days. But all of a sudden, it was as if I blasphemed God. Because now I had to fight the contra-culture of my Christian teaching. The contra-culture of our Western teaching. The contra-culture that that could be blasphemed to God and certainly sacrilegious to say that Jesus had flaws? Come on. You see, if he's not perfect, he had flaws. Uh Uh-oh. Boy, I'm looking at cold stone faces right now. All I know is, as I began to deal into it more, it says, 
I see him and the glory of him as, as if I'm looking into a looking glass. And <laughs> there happened to be a mirror in that studio. And I looked into it and I saw me and I said, Jesus, if you're looking at me and I'm looking at you, there's some flaws in this dude. So doing what we should all do, I dug into the Word and went to old scriptures that I knew. And I went to new scriptures that needed to be renewed. And here's what happened, and then we'll go through it. I realized that as I got this revelation and dared to ask about the imperfections of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was made flesh. How many of you know flesh is not perfect? Huh? How many of you know flesh is not perfect? He came in the flesh, and the spirit that denies that is the spirit of the Antichrist. Because the fact that he became flesh is the reason that we overcome flesh. If he had not become flesh, we could not overcome. And I realized this, that as I embraced the humanity of Jesus Christ, listen to me. This is the first time in all my years of service to God, my study, my going deep, that I can honestly tell you that my soul has intimately embraced the humanity of Jesus Christ. I didn't just say it. I didn't just accept it. It wasn't just a credo in my faith that he came as man. It wasn't something I just glossed over. I pushed into and embraced and do embrace now the humanity of Jesus Christ. You see... I learn and expect to know him, and I'm constantly trying to, to know him better as Jesus Lord. My perfect, righteous, holy, never sinning God. But I don't know about how many of you, but I never really pressed in to understand the flaws of Jesus Christ, the imperfections. And what I found out is that as I embrace that more, I can embrace him more in making me righteous before God. Without the one, I can't do the other. I thought I could, but I couldn't. You see, there's a weight and scale in our revelation of who Jesus is. Jesus is God. Jesus is Lord. He came from perfection. He laid down His Spirit of glory, and He came to earth. But He came as a man and a baby. And He did things that weren't sin, but they weren't perfect. So how do I relate to that? Well, I relate to it by, first of all, recalling my children as babies. They didn't do things that were perfect, but I don't want to call it sin. Was it sin that one of my daughters would pick up a bowl of spaghetti and throw it at one year old? I don't know. I don't think that was sin. That was imperfection, wasn't it? There wasn't a trying to show me that, oh, am I going to be disobedient to you? It was because that bowl was very enticing. That bowl was tempting. That bowl was there for a reason. If you weren't going to eat it, you may as well throw it. It wasn't sin. And, and so it is with us and with him. And as I embrace this, I understand that when I have a bad day, or when a bad day tries to have me, it's not necessarily sin. Are you following me? Are you getting me? Are you getting set free from religion? You see, that's what that is. It's religion that says that Jesus Christ was absolutely perfect, never did anything wrong. If you believe that and hold on to that, then you haven't read your scriptures. And if you have, you glossed over what you didn't want to accept. Let's delve into it a little bit. It's going to take more than one session, I think. You know, I just have this nature about me of striking nerves in the body of Christ. I can't help it. And you get what you get, and those who've known me long enough know that I had to come to the place where I simply didn't care what people think. And I never really cared about being judged anymore <coughs> by those that, I respect it as knowing more than me. And I got beyond the place of needing affirmation in order to get to that place where I could become confident 
in my own faith and in my own calling, wherever it goes, however it goes, whenever it goes, without pressing the pedal to push. It's a good place to be because then you are accountable to God Almighty and you're accountable to those that you hold close to you and you listen, but you're not accountable to religion and you're not accountable to to tradition. Whether we expect it or understand it here in this country and those of us who are born again and called the born againers and have gone through all of the many phases since Azusa Street and uh, I haven't been there since Azusa Street, but we're the ones who receive the, the honey from the, the dew in that. And we understand, you know, the charismatic movement, the love me movement, the hippie movement. We understand Pentecostalism. We understand the prophetic movement, the apostolic movement. There's a kingdom movement. There's all kind of movements, right? We get them. But each one of those embeds into us another conforming ritual. And when we don't conform to those things, we're out of place, at least for the time. Right? And we've all been through it. But then we sort of linger and languish and we carry that with us to the next place that God's sending us to. And we're on the move to another next place right now. And I believe part of that next place is being made to overcome. And to be made to overcome, we need to embrace the humanity of Jesus Christ along with the divinity of Jesus Christ. Because He's one. And he understands because, not because he just lived here and took notes and, 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 and was a spectator and a witness. He understands because he lived it. And that's where embracing the humanity sets us free. So, let's look at a few things. First of all, how about Jesus in the garden? Now, I paraphrase something for you because I've been having fun with my frankly speaking Bible. I speak it my way in the way that I'm allowed to do that. I'm not rewriting the word. I'm interpreting the word. I've seen some interpretations of the word. I don't understand how they got to where they got to that are Bibles that are called out there. At least I understand mine, and and I think it's true. So, But it's only for me. I'm not force feeding on anybody else. But in the frankly speaking Bible... I saw this scripture where Jesus was in the garden and he said, Father, lift this cup from me. It's too heavy. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Boy, that sounds so nice and religious, doesn't it? I mean, yes, I says, wow, Jesus is amazing that he could do that, knowing what was before him. And I could never get to that level. Come on. You could be sitting there facing, knowing you're going to get spikes driven into your legs and your arms. You're going to be ridiculed and spit on, thorns crashed on you. You're going to have to carry a log that's too heavy for you to move. Five seals couldn't pick it up and carry it. Oh, you're just going to languish in that and say, Lord, let's do it. Huh? Here's the way I got it. This is the way I interpreted it. Jesus said, Father, I'm having a bad day. This is a really bad day. As much as I knew and prepared, I'm really not prepared as I thought I could be for this bad day. So I really don't want to do this. In my humanity, I don't want to do this. But if it has to be, then let's get it on. Scripture, again, interpretation according to the frankly speaking Bible. I don't know about you, but I've had some things I didn't want to do in the kingdom of God. And I asked him to make them go away, and they didn't go away. You know, I've said it to you before, I'm going to say it again, and I have the right to say this. The office of the prophet is, is not one of joy and glory. It's been made into one in this system that we're in right now where people are chasing the words of prophets like dogs after a a, a pebble of of, of food wrapped up in peanut butter. My wife loves that commercial. Oh yeah, just someone throws it out. They get the name of a prophet and there's three million people waiting for every word they have to say to hang on it. And most of the time they don't really have anything to say at all. It's the same regurgitated crap. 
And in this instance, we see that the prophetic's been washed down to something that really is nothing more than just another tradition and culture. You see, many times I have much more respect from the Bible class teacher than I do for those who call themselves a pro prophets and apostles. And I'm not knocking the office, it's real. What I'm knocking is those who step into an office that they're not invited to and not qualified to be in. You see, the real, the real issue with a prophet is that God will use you to say things and do things that are so absurd and so up against upstream that the first thing you do is get rejected and persecuted. That's the real test of a prophet. If everybody's kumbaya, yay, let's go along with you. Yes, says the Lord, we're going to have, the river's going to overflow with salmon, and we're going to have walleye tonight. Just cast your net. You're going to have enough food. You don't have to worry. Oh, we all like that. Let's roll and go with it. But the real test of a prophet is what happens when the Lord has you give a word. I don't want to give. Huh? Happened in my life multiple times times and the toughest one is when God sends you to a really famous man of God or in some instances a woman of God for me men of God and you have a word and you don't want to give it to him and you didn't even know him and the Lord says I'll make a way you go I, Lord I, I, they got people near and they got boards they got yeah, send them and then the back of your neck gets warm and hot as the Lord begins to get a little angry with you. And what I begin to see is not a God smiling at me, but one who's like, mm -hmm. you go or you don't go? Who are you? And then you go and you bring this word and most of the time it's received just like you think it will. Rejected, angry, blown off. And you walk out like, ah. There goes that relationship for eternity. And then you commiserate when not long after the consequences of them not obeying God is death. How many of you like to have to go give somebody that consequence? Thus saith the Lord. Repent and change your heart or you will become insignificant to me. That's a bad day. But God's moving in the bad day. How about Noah? Huh? Noah had a lot of bad days. I mean, I understand that the tradition of men and women in that day supposedly, as we're told, was much different and the women just went along with it and did anything. But I can't believe that Noah's wife didn't get upset with him for 99 years. <laughs> well, that dude was not doing anything to make a living for the family. Come on. And he's building this big boat on dry land and nobody knows what's going on and the whole community is saying how crazy they are, how crazy he is. It's a cult. Ah. That's the word that gets thrown at you when you have a word from the Lord that people don't like. It's a cult. He's a cult. Don't go there. <laughs> Used to hurt. Now I laugh. I laugh. And can you imagine Noah, day after day, he's, I mean, he, didn't, he had to make everything. He had to make his tools. You understand? He had to make those wooden nails and wedges that, that he had to soak them so they, would, so they would, 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 would get bigger. And he had to find that wood and he had to thatch it. And he had to figure out how to make something waterproof when there was never before something waterproof like that. He had to figure out how to make it so big that nobody could move it. There was no amount of elephants that could pick it up and change it. He had to figure out how to raise his children without making a living. He had a lot of bad days. And you think it was a good day when the Lord said, get all those stinky animals in the ark, move them in there two by two. Yeah, you and your boys, you start shoveling the poop and throwing it out of there. And we're going to put more in there and you close up the door and you wait. That's a bad day. Uh, yeah, think about it. 
That's a bad day. No amount of Loomis or Poof's going to get rid of that air. That's a bad day. And then I can imagine his wife. <laughs> I told you. Now you made it even worse. It's hot in here. The animals stink. What are you doing? But his only way out was, hey, they came, didn't he? These animals came. Well, you're right about that, but maybe crazy knows crazy. And all of a sudden the water comes and they begin to hear shrieking and crying. And they're looking out through little porthole, maybe, maybe not. Floating along in a, in a big boat that just swashes all around and the waters keep coming up and the animals are baying and screaming and in his mind, he doesn't feel so good because everybody outside's getting killed. And he thinks, will this last a day? Again, if you've ever been incarcerated, a day becomes a week, a week, a month, a month, a year. Will it last two weeks? Will it last a month? Will it last a year? Somewhat after a year, finally, finally, that imprisonment ends. And it's time to start a whole new world. Everything's gone. Everything that was is, is no more. Grandma's cabin is gone. The pastures are gone. The food is gone. The plantings are gone. Nothing left except Noah, the family he put in there, and the animals. God gives them a mandate. Do it new again. Let's start all over. I wondered. You know, we get that glimpse of Jesus on the cross when all creation got quiet on that third watch and that three o'clock in the afternoon time is best we can understand. And he died and he said it is finished. Everything got dark and quiet and gloomy. Creation stopped. The birds weren't chirping as we discovered last week the insects went back in their holes it was death darkness that was on the earth for a whole year do you think god was smiling and rejoicing do you think the father was celebrating the commiseration i think he was sad now yes he can spread it all over eternity and that's a good thing for you and me when we understand our humanity with the eternal God. He can take that moment and say, I know what it was, I know what it is, but I'm out of the moment and I'm in the moment and I know what it's going to be now. And I know that my son's going to come and I know when he does there's going to be righteousness again in all the earth, at least an opportunity for it. He knew all of that, but he's still in the moment. Beloved, God knows your bad day. He's in your moment. He can spread it out over eternity and know that it's going to get better and that the world is going to revive again and that you're going to revive again if you hold on to Him. But He's in your bad day. He's having a bad day with you. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Do you understand when we embrace the humanity of God, we can embrace our faith better? Is it starting to fall upon you and make sense like maybe it never did before? that we dare not blaspheme, we dare not sacralize, but we do say, I'm not going to be bound by religion. I'm not going to be a Pharisee who speaks things of God as if they're truths, but inside I've got dead bones. I don't want to be that beloved. I want to be real with my God. My Jesus got real with me, and he's real with me, and I want to be as real with him as I can be. I want to be able to walk in a bad day and a bad time and say, Lord, I'm having a bad time. Are you having it with me? I don't know about you, but it doesn't help in your worst moments when some beaming Christian comes to you smiling without even a tear and a red eye. And they, oh, glory to God. You look at him and you just want to smack them right across the teeth. But when they come and they hug you and they weep with you, and they say, I feel what you feel. Jesus feels what you feel. We're going to get through this. It's going to be better. 
now reality hits. <clears throat> I saw a little thing last night on TBN. I've gotten to know some of the people pretty good. And Mike Rowan's there. I don't know how many of you ever watched that program. And you ought to if you're not the way I see it or whatever it's called. And Matt and he, they do an interview and they do these reenactments of things. And the one that they show, and they're done very well, by the way. They're really like little mini movies. And this one was filmed in Oklahoma. I happen to know the exact production studio. And they, they did this reenactment of this young boy that went to this man who had one of the most popular little programs on TV at the time. And he brought him a can. And the can was wallpaper cleaner. And this was, you know, right after World War II and coming into when TV was finding its place. And this was one of the most popular programs on TV. And he said to him, I, I want you to promote this, to market this on your program. But I don't have any money. And the man looked at it and he said, my program, the average age of people watching me is seven or eight years old. Why would they want to buy a wallpaper cleaner? And the young man said, I think if you'll try this, I'll give you 2% of the whole business. Just try it and see what happens. The man thought about it. Eventually, he persuaded him to do it. You see, that wallpaper cleaner had been developed and invented by his father who made a deal with Kroger's that he had something that could clean wallpaper because at that time, coal was the way that you heated your houses and the coal would end up putting soot on the walls and wallpaper was the thing. So people needed to clean their wallpaper and if you tried to wash it with soap, it just smeared more, you could damage your wallpaper. And this man, this young man's father, he made a deal with Kroger to manufacture wallpaper, and they said, if you're missing by one day, we'll sign this deal with you. You owe us $5,000 a day. $5,000 a day at that time was, what, $100,000 now? The man didn't have it yet. He hadn't even made it. So he went to work to meet his deadline, trying and trying, and finally he came up with this paste. And this paste, you'd put it on the wallpaper, and it would lift everything that was on that wallpaper off, and it wouldn't damage the wallpaper at all, and it wouldn't stick to it. And he bottled this paste and he put it in one pound jars and he made thousands and thousands and thousands of them and he had a good run with Kroger until electricity and furnace heating came out, gas heating. All of a sudden, the coal furnaces were converted. Nobody needed to clean their wallpaper. This man was stuck with hundreds of thousands of pounds of this stuff. And then he crashed in an airplane and left his company to the son. Son didn't know what to do with all this stuff, so he went to this man and he made that offer. If you'll try to market this on your program, which is one of the most popular watch programs there are. I, I don't have any money. I can't pay you to advertise, but I'll give you 2%. The man said, I'll think about it. About a month later, he test marketed it on his program. And all of a sudden, he found out that it was selling off the shelves, and what was selling for 25 cents was selling for a buck 50 for the pound jar. And you know what it was? Play Doh. And you know who marketed it? Captain Kangaroo. And you know that Captain Kangaroo made more money doing that than he did with his program? It was a bad day. It was a bad day for that boy's daddy. It was a bad day that became a good day, and then it became a bad day again, and then it became a better day. Billions of dollars of play dust sold. Spread across time. Part of the theme today. Your bad day spread across time begins to dilute, and I thought of it this way. Now, I know some of you here, you toil the ground, you live in the ground, right? You understand farming somewhat. You, you appreciate it. I grew up in that realm. 
I love, love farms. I love animals. I love the whole, I love the smell. I'm so crazy, I even like the smell of manure on a fresh field. Because my window was right next to the neighbor's field, and every year, twice a year, the manure would come, and it coming right in my, we didn't have air conditioning. We didn't even have a fan. My daddy said, ain't no way you're wasting electricity in this house. We didn't even own one. We had little dim light bulbs, and if you left that light bulb on when you weren't supposed to, that light bulb got unscrewed and you didn't have one no more. Not even to study with. So that window was open, that manure would come in, and I learned to like the smell because I related it to the fact that something good was going to come out of that field soon, and I knew what it was. It was sweet corn. And I know I could go into that field and eat that corn raw right off, and it was good. And I knew the neighbor would tell me, pick as much as you want, and I'd bring it to my mama or to a lady named Emma down the, that helped live with us and my grandfather, and she'd make this corn. And it was so good. So the manure helped to bring something that was sweet. And what happens when you're farming like that, the soil gets old and tired. It needs to be moved. It needs to be agitated. It needs to have a bad day. It needs to be broken up. And the old stuff has to be ground in and gone out of there. And the old stuff passes away. And then there's a fertilizer put on it. Now, if you can afford it in today's market, these fertilizers do wonders. But manure still works. If you can get enough of it. My grandpa used to have me carry buckets, black five-gallon buckets, one on each side, eight years old. Can you imagine? Now, a bucket weighs 40 pounds with water and manure in it. I had 80 pounds as an eight-year-old. Didn't even know any better. My goal was try not to let it slop on my legs because it was black tar manure in water, and we would take it to his little things that he was growing, and then he would pour it on there so that they would grow better. And I had to learn as I ate that stuff out of the garden not to think about the black buckets of manure that I poured on there the sweetness that came from it, the fertilization of that soil, a soil that was useless, and if you don't rotate it and help it, it grows thorns and bad stuff. It's not as good. You don't continue to plant the same crop in the same place over and over and over. You'll learn very quickly why the Lord said to change that stuff in the Scriptures. It's the same with you and I. The Lord takes that bad day that foul smell of the stuff that, that, that's coming off our flesh that's burning and agitated and irritated and upset. And in that instance, he mixes it up with the fertile soil and he blows upon it. And his tears, along with your tears, hear me again, his tears, along with your tears, they irrigate it. And all of a sudden, little buds begin to come out of the ground. And as they grow, they become a fruit, a fruit of the Spirit. And there's a rebirthing. But remember, it doesn't mean you're not going to have a bad day because those weeds, they get down in that soil. It might take them a little longer to come up, but dang it. Those ragweeds with all of the jaggers on them. How many of you ever had to go in between the rows of the crops and pull them out? You curse those weeds, man. You did. If you liked that, something was wrong with you. And you wonder, how did they make it? But they'd start coming up. And you pull them out and you get the hoe. And if you didn't, they'd come again. They were relentless. They just kept coming back. But the corn grew taller. The lettuce grew fuller. And yes, the pest came to try and steal it. Huh? The rabbits, all oh, you cute little rabbits. I hated those little things, man. They try to steal your stuff. You got chickens, a fox will come try to get it. Foxes look pretty, right? I want to shoot every one of them. I don't like them. They kill your chickens. They kill your chickens. Do you like chicken? Do you eat chicken? You want to eat some fox? No, I want to eat chicken. 
Those fox would get our chicken, get our ducks. You know how we knew? Because they have a hole in their neck. That's how the fox gets them. They get every little foul and thing that we had. They come to steal them. The pests come out to steal your fruit. You're going to have another bad day, but now you've overcome it. And you know you can do it again. And you can take some confidence knowing that the Lord is crying with you. I thought of this one. The contrast of the good and the bad day. Jesus, Jesus, your friend, your best friend, Lazarus, he's dying. We know if you just come and pray for him, Lord, he'll be healed. He's your best friend. Now, you know, that's like having partners in a ministry. Lazarus was a wealthy guy. You know, Jesus needed some people to help him out. He didn't just make money. He, had, he was human. He needed to get some money. His disciples needed to eat. Yeah, they had the miracles when all else failed so he could show them. But he is Jehovah Jireh who provides, but, but they, they, had to, they had to make ends meet. And Lazarus was his friend and he'd stay in Lazarus' house and they'd have banquets for him. And I'm sure that the sisters would come out and deliver them probably to Judas, a love offering to help sustain the Lord. This was his friend more than a friend probably his closest friend we know of on earth but he didn't go he didn't go because he was lazy he didn't go because for whatever reasons it wasn't in his plans for that day or the next and finally she comes and says Lord he's dead but if you would have been there this wouldn't have happened do you think Jesus celebrated that? Do you think he mocked her? What he said was, calm down. I'm in this bad day with you. He's sleeping. But then it gets a little twisted, doesn't it? He gets there and he gets close and he sees all the people mourning and the impact of his humanity hits him. His friend is dead and his loved ones are hurted. They're wounded. Chances are he saw the grandchildren. Uh, humanity. The family was there. The patriarch of the family was dead. Jesus starts to cry. Short of scripture in all the Bible, he wept. Why? It was perfect. All he had to do was say the word like the centurion told him. Say the word. My servant's healed. You don't need to go. Just say the word. He didn't say the word. He didn't do anything. He went there and wept. He wept because he was human. He went there to experience death of a beloved dear friend because he was human and he's had the experience and it didn't feel good. And today when we have those experiences of loved ones, he weeps. And he knows no matter what our faith is, it hurts. I said, Lord, now I get it. Now I get it. It's not a weakness of faith. It's a strength of humanity that we could weep with you, that we could feel like you. And then we know the story ends the way we like it to end. He called him forth. And Lazarus came out of the grave. Beloved, if you've got an illness, he's weeping with you. Listen to me. He, he's not celebrating it. He's commiserating with you. He, he's got it. He understands. And he knows what it means to have some fear. It's in the scriptures. I'm not going to be able to get to it all today. You say, what, Jesus had some fear? Yeah. Yeah, he had to fight it off. It tried to come upon him because he had a human mind. And the mind blinder was trying to throw fear into his mind. And he had to fight it off just like you and I have to fight it off. And he had to lift up his faith just like you and I have to lift up our faith. Now, I don't know. There's some who have taught Jesus never had a cold. I don't like, I don't like that. I don't like it that he never had a cold. I like it better that he had a cold and knows what it's like when I have a cold. 
He's saying, Frank, are you blaspheming? I'm not blaspheming. I'm embracing the humanity of my Lord. And I'm also embracing the fact that even though he put Lazarus' family because of his attitude of not wanting to get there when he did for whatever his reasons are, it wasn't sin. Do you know how many times I feel like I let God down in sin because I didn't get somewhere where somebody wanted me to be when they wanted me? It hurts. You carry it with you. Or when one of your sheep tells you that you offended him in a way you didn't even know you did and you can't even embrace him anymore. It hurts. But then I realize it's not sin. It's imperfection of humanity and offenses. How liberating, how free to know that I can be imperfect and that it's not sin. How liberating to know that Jesus understands it completely. That he's not up there trying to condemn me with my mistakes, my failures, my shortcomings, but he's trying to find a way to make it right for me. How liberating to embrace with my Lord in our perfections. And to be honest with Him about my imperfections. One scripture I want us to go to, I'll build back up to it if the Lord allows me next week. like us to uh, turn to Matthew 21 the fig tree how many of you know about Jesus and the fig tree how many of you say it makes perfect sense to me oh, you're, you're putting your hand up and saying no thank you because it still doesn't make perfect sense to me I'm not saying that I'm better than you but but I fasted and prayed about it and still couldn't figure it all out, but this much I got. It says in the morning, Matthew 21, I think verse 18, I might not have the right one. In the morning as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. Hey, Jesus became hungry. Hello? Perfect Jesus became hungry. Is God the Father hungry? Is his stomach need filled with food? I don't think so. But I do like to think that maybe we'll be allowed to eat some good food up in heaven. I don't know. I mean, I like good food. I just don't like what it does to me. But, but I like good food. Can you imagine always being 32 years old and slim and trim and looking like a gladiator and eating anything you want? Having ice cream cones before you go to bed. and ooh, Cheesecake. All the spaghetti and meatballs you want, ribs, some nice kosher food, huh? Yeah. Jesus was hungry. And seeing a tree by the wayside, he went to it. You know what that tells me? He had an expectation from that tree that was going to satisfy his hunger. He didn't know everything at all once and all the time like we all think he did. He was human too. The Lord let him know what he needed to know, when he needed to know it, and how he needed to know it, just like we do. The Holy Spirit will say stuff to us and half the time we don't pay attention. And we step in doo-doo that he's trying to keep us out of. And then we blame it on God or someone else. I like blaming it on anybody else. Whoever's in sight, Jimmy, my wife, I call somebody, it's your fault. It's just my thing. He was hungry, he went to that place by the wayside to a tree, and when he went to it, he found nothing on it but only leaves. 
let's go the other way. He found leaves on it, but no food. You see, the expectation was, this is a healthy tree. It's got leaves. The reason it has leaves, it's supposed to propagate. It's supposed to make a fruit. It's a fig tree. Figs come from fig trees. Trees that have leaves, they're supposed to have something come out of that leaf. An apple tree has apple leaves, and then apples come out of it. So he had an expectation. It was in the season. Don't let someone tell you it was out of season. It was in season. People get crazy about their interpretations. Jesus wouldn't go and expect an out-of-the-season fruit. He expected fruit. And he went to it, and it only had leaves. He was having a bad day. He was hungry. He's probably on his way to the fig tree saying, Oh, Holy Father, thank you for this fig. I'm ready for some nice, fresh figs. To this day in the Mideast and Israel, and that, that's their fruit of choice, figs. To this day, they have fig trees. I've eaten figs off the trees there. Figs, nice, big, round, precious figs that never had any kind of chemicals put on them. Coming out of trees. They grow there. And he went to the tree and had no figs. He had a bad attitude. I mean, this poor defenseless tree just sitting there trying to grow fruit itself, probably. It had no mind about what to do or not to do about fruit. It's about as innocent as a puppy dog. And what did he say? I curse you. You'll never have fruit come from you again. And the fig tree died at once. Ooh, get cursed by Jesus. Just another thought. You know he's coming back, right? He's coming back. And he's coming back with a whole, a whole army. Angels, saints, all dressed in white. All dressed in white. That means there's not going to be any blood flailing around. You don't wear white to a battle. And it says that he's going to win by blowing his breath upon the enemy. Whew. Whew. That's what he did to that fig tree. He killed it with the nefesh of God. The tree died. Now we go on and we'll do that next week if the Lord allows because it was an example of hypocrisy. Read up ahead of me and you'll see that he had seven woes upon the Pharisees of their hypocrisy. You see, I think Jesus that day, he got a theme of hypocrisy in his spirit. And he knew he was going to go into that temple and take on whatever it was. He thought he was going to get there just like the fig tree. It was going to be refreshing. He ran into more hypocrisy. And to him, that fig tree was a hypocrite. Supposed to make fees, no figs. Curse you. You will never bear fruit again. He got a little worse, as we're going to find out with the Pharisees. He said, you're going to hell. That's what he told them. Nothing's going to save you. He said, you're going to hell. That's, woo! That's having a bad attitude. I don't know about you. I've never cursed somebody since I've known the Lord and said, you're going to hell. Because I couldn't, but he couldn't. Jesus was having a bad day. And we see the fruit of it. You know, I'm going to finish with this. The other thing it tells me, there was no tree huggers back in that day. We got tree huggers. I build and I develop. I have to go in and talk to towns. And, you know, you're taking out one tree, you got to give them 50 trees. You got to tell them what the caliper of the tree is. If it's two inches, you got to give them 50 inches of calipers of trees. We had a project in Coconut Grove some years back. I don't know if you know where Coconut Grove is down in South Florida. We were building some houses and clearing the land. And sure enough, three guys, and a, no, two guys and a woman came up with bicycles and helmets on. They got out with chains. They chained themselves to three of the trees and locked it. I said, whoa, they're tree huggers. Now, Frank Flesh just want to cut the tree down and say, hey, how you like that? But of course, the news media came and everybody came. So they said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to go home. I'm going to see my children and I'm going to let these tree huggers love those trees. They lasted about a day, day and a half. They were out of there. And the trees came down and we gave them the calipers they were looking for. 
I think back on that while I was thinking of the bad about cursing those trees, and I laughed about it. No more fruit from those trees. But we planted 50 other trees that gives fruit. Beloved, it's okay to have a bad day. Next week, the Lord allows, we're going to talk some more about the humanity of Christ. He had a lot of bad days, and the worst one he ever had here as a human ended up being our best day. A lot of bad days. It's what we do in the bad day. It's what we do with the bad news. It's how we process it. But remember this. Because you have a bad attitude about something, because you don't quite respond perfectly, that's not sin. It's what you do with the bad attitude that can become sin. Do you understand me? Let me give you an example. I'll make it personal. You could say, you know what, Pastor Frank? I just, I just can't stand you. I don't like the way you preach. I don't like the way you look. I don't like your theology. And okay, we part ways. But you go out and you begin to gossip and curse and say bad things. That's the sin. That's when it crosses over. The feeling isn't a sin. The bad attitude isn't a sin. It's what you do with it. For us, we learn to process it through the grace, love, faith of God. It might take a little while, beloved. Uh, you know, we're junk. You and I are junk. God's going to make us nice. So we understand our flesh is junk. It takes them a little while to polish that stuff off and make it nice. It's what we do with it. So we're going to learn and we're going to dig it down and we're going to plant those pillars in our foundation of faith so that we know exactly what to do and how to do, when to do it when the flood tides come upon us. Amen? Last one, you're having a bad day, confess it. What? Confess it. Don't defend it. I'm having a bad day. I don't know about you, but, you know, I'm putting a few more days on this body, and sometimes there's things that hurt on this body. I don't know how it happened between night and morning, and, and I'm not going to celebrate it. When my foot's swollen and hurting, and it's arthritic, I'm, what I celebrate is they told me I would never walk again. It's 99.9% .9 incurable arthritis, but guess what? I'm walking. So, yeah, sometimes my foot swells up and it hurts. I don't celebrate that foot, but I say, I'm going to celebrate what the Lord did. And you know what, foot? You and I are going to get over it today. It's what we do with the bad attitude. Sometimes you've got to take two aspirins and walk away and, you know, rest a minute and then face it again. Now I understand that scripture. I don't know if you did before. Be angry and sin not. Did you ever understand that? Really understand it before? How do you be angry and don't sin? Huh? All I know is you can't even bring your gift to the altar if you're anger. But you can be angry and not sin. That means you can have some issues that keep you away from the altar, but that doesn't mean you're a sinner. Oh, wow. It opens up the whole world to me. It opens up the... I don't need to be perfect. Wow! You don't need to be perfect. Your loved ones don't need to be perfect. Your wife doesn't need to be perfect, and God knows you're not perfect. Ben. Your children don't need to be perfect. Not even the president needs to be perfect. And we haven't had a perfect one in a long time. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this understanding of embracing your humanity. We thank you, Jesus, that you not only came in, in the flesh, here as man, but also God, but, but Lord, that, that you did, you did experience the things that we experience, as the writer of Hebrews says in 4.15. You did. You did allow those things to, to incur in your body. You were made susceptible to the same things we are. The forces of the world. Persecution. The curse of a religion that doesn't allow love. Being rejected. 
fighting off forces and evil. You understand it, Lord. You, you got it. So, Father, be stronger in us. Let us make more room for you in the frailty of our beings. Let us not be so pumped up in spirit that we miss the intimacy of embracing you in our humanity. Yes, you were man and also God. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for it. We relish it. We worship you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.